joining us for the IEEE Computer Society Standards Webinar Series, brought to you by the Standards Activities Board. With over 225 standards that transform the way we live, work, and communicate, the IEEE Computer Society sets the standard for design automation, simulation, testing technologies, Ethernet and Wi-Fi, quality assurance processes, systems architecture, DevOps, and more. Standards deliver best practice processes for developing market-ready interoperating systems, products, and services. You can have an impact by joining one of the over 200 IEEE Computer Society Standards Working Groups. Participating in one of the working groups grants you access to information that reduces risks, increases proficiency, and shapes the future of the industry. Help determine what's next in computing technology. Learn more about our standard working groups at computer.org slash standards. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today and welcome to today's webinar, Zero Trust, Changing the Security Paradigm by Eric Hibbard from our Standards Activities Webinar Board Series. My name is Scott Levine. I'm the membership manager here at the IEEE Computer Society, and I'll be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I'd like to address some housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. You can ask any question, any question you have in the Q&A box you see on your screen, and Eric will answer as many questions as he can following the presentation. If possible, please reference the slide your question refers to. A copy of the slide and the recorded webinar will be emailed to you um, tomorrow. The concept of zero trust, no trust by default, and assumes you are operating in a hostile environment, hostile environment is not new. But it is such a paradigm shift from perimeter-based security that its adoption has been slow. This is due in part to the absence of standards and guidance in this space. With the, least, with, with the release of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, Zero Trust Architecture and Executive Order Improving the Nation's Cybersecurity, the vis visibility and importance of Zero Trust were elevated significantly in at least the US. Recognizing that the international community could benefit from Zero Trust standards, the IEEE Computer Society established the Zero Trust Security Working Group and approved two projects in this space. The first is IEEE P P3409 for a Zero Trust Security Framework focused on relevant terminology concepts and identification of core elements that are derived from existing Zero Trust architectures. The other is IEEE P2887 Recommended practice for zero trust security provides security guidance for zero trust architectures and implementations based on IEEE P3409. As mentioned, join us today is Eric Hibbard, who is a senior security and privacy professional with expertise in a wide range of technologies. He is chair of the IEEE Cybersecurity and Privacy Standards Committee. Eric is involved in several other standards, standardization activities and holds leadership roles within the American Bar Association the and the Cloud Security Alliance. I'll let Eric finish introducing himself on his related knowledge and background. So Eric, thank you for being here today and the floor is yours to get us started. Thank you, Scott. Gee, I was worried you were gonna do the presentation for me there. <laughs> so, um, Thank you for joining the session today um, and uh, happy security month since October is, is you know, where, where we try to focus on security and within, within IEEE, we always try to do a, a security webinar during, during October. Um, this session, um, we're, we're gonna take a look at, at Zero Trust um, from a bit of a standards perspective, give you some background on on where uh, you know what's involved with zero trust, but it's not intended to be a, a deep dive session. In fact, part of this is to, uh, as as Scott was pointing out, make you aware of some of the activities within IEEE, and ultimately 
if this is a topic of interest, encourage you to, uh, to join. So um, you've already seen the the abstract, uh, maybe a little bit more about me. I'm, I'm definitely a standards geek. Um, and not only am I uh, chair of the IEEE Computer Society's Cybersecurity and Privacy Standards Committee, but I also chair Insights uh, Technical Committee, Cybersecurity and Privacy, which is the U.S. Committee dealing with ISO uh, Subcommittee 27, which focuses on security. So you, you might say security is kind of in, 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 in my blood, as well as privacy. Um, actively working as an editor, as well as you know leadership roles, and my forte is, is really in data security and, and storage security. Um, been involved with, with IEEE for a number of years, going back at least to uh, 2004 kind of time frame. Okay, so enough about me. So what, what uh, you know, since, since this is built as a, a paradigm change, um, we sort of have to set the stage. Um, so what what's happening now, and and so what really sort of what constitutes you know a, a a paradigm change here. So most folks, if you're operating or have familiarity with security, will hear that we use you know some form of perimeter security. So um, the the basic idea here is that um, you're using a combination of hardware and software um, to essentially create a barrier, think of it as like a shield, if you will, um, between you know, your enterprise or organization and what's happening in the Wild West, so to speak, uh, you know, also known as the internet. Um, the goal is really to, to try and, and protect sensitive data um, and you know, prevent uh, any unauthorized access to, to resources. So, um, you, you've probably heard of denial of service attacks and things like that, where where they're not really gaining the attackers aren't really gaining access, but they're they're having impacts on on uh, legitimate users, you know, being able to to, to access resources. Um, th this this model assumes that that um, all users inside the network are basically trusted to some level, and basically everybody outside is um, essentially. Um, untrusted until you know proven otherwise. Um, you know, and, and that's you know kind of an interesting model. It's been around for quite some time. Uh, it 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 also fundamentally assumes that that you in fact can can establish this barrier. Um, but for many enterprises, there's really no single easy way to establish that perimeter. If you think about subsidiaries you've got multiple sites um and and then when you add in remote workers you know as a result of and, and we've really seen this with with you know the impact of covid um where in, in some cases the, the the inside network had almost nobody running on it and the outside network had most of the workforce um that really stressed um implementations that, that we're using essentially as perimeter security model because it wasn't in many cases designed to to accommodate um you know that that many you know external users with that that, that have legitimate needs to access the resources so um in many cases this perimeter security model also has embedded in it um uh, a demilitarized zone, uh, or DMZ, as we sometimes refer to it, where we 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 have resources that that need to be accessible, um, and and so they're they're put in basically sandwiched between a, a couple of sets of firewalls, um, so that they are accessible from the internet, um, but they are themselves partitioned off from from the the internal land and, and again this just further complicates so now you've got a uh you know you've got a special little region where you you're encouraging if you will um 
you know, connectivity from the internet. So you can't just cut off all access, um, but you do limit uh, the kinds of systems there. So it's pretty routine. You have web servers and email servers and things like that in this space. The technologies that are used to, to help with sort of this barrier or this perimeter, they usually come down to, to firewalls and then um, intrusion detection systems, which are used to try and monitor you know, behavior that, that's uh, not desirable, uh, potential attacks. And, and to sort of help shepherd in the, the legitimate users, we use virtual private networks, or you, you may be familiar with the term VPN. Um, and, and in fact, with COVID, it's these VPNs that ran into serious trouble. They were, they were in, in some cases, sized to handle maybe 1% of the workforce at any given point in time. And then all of a sudden, 75 or 80% of the workforce was having to come through these VPNs and they, you know, the implementations just weren't designed to deal with. But all of this basically assumes that you know you can you can establish this perimeter and and what we're finding is that's just not a legitimate um, way of looking at it. You, you end up enterprises end up configuring their firewalls with so many exceptions that that in effect they they're little more than a speed bump for for attackers. They're not really providing the kinds of protection that's needed uh, unless you end up deploying firewalls within with inside of these internal networks. Uh, and, and, and I've definitely seen that that's, you know, one of the scenarios, which sort of defeats the purpose of, you know, trying to, to have this hard shell that you're, you know, protecting, you know, the enterprise, you know, resources and, and assets. All right, so that's, you know, kind of where, where things have been. Um, so what is, what is this zero trust stuff? Um, well, basically, there's this focus on on data and and service protection, but um, it can expand out to include you know, specific assets. So you can use it to shield certain kinds of you know infrastructure components. Um, you can use it for uh, cloud, uh, whether it's on prem or you know off prem. Um, you can you can actually have it focus on particular applications or, you know, users, um, or even if you've got, um, you know, machine to machine kind of activities, uh, you can, you can actually use zero trust to, to, to help with those kinds of situations. But basically, this is a big shift in that um, there's no implicit trust. And if you remember in the current, the current the perimeter base, if you're on the inside, there's this implicit trust that if you're in there, then you have a legitimate reason to get at, you know, whatever is 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 available in the zero trust model. Um, no such assumption is is basically made. Okay, so this has been around for for you know quite some time. Um, I know the U.S. government has been playing around with it. Playing around is probably not the right word, but exp you know trying to trying to fine tune their their protections in, in ways and going back easily 20 years, maybe longer, where there's there's actual implementations that are putting up, you know, controls that that uh, you know sort of deal with this. Um, <clears throat> however, a a recent development is the publication of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. This is the NIST special publication 800-207, um, and this is the zero trust architecture. And, and what it does is it describes um, essentially uh, the, the concepts, what, you know, how do you go about dealing with this? What are the things that you've got to worry about? What are the implications? Even, even some, some information on how one might transition to a zero trust oriented, uh, you know, sort of environment. Uh, it's very rare that that you know an organization has the ability to sort of do, you know greenfield. You know, you don't start from scratch. Um, in many ways, you've got perimeter based security mechanisms in place, and so how do you 
how do you move from where you're at to to zero trust? Do you even need to go, you know, completely in in a zero trust, you know, direction? And this document was one of the the first that really sort of laid out the concepts and 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 ideas um, in, in a pretty holistic manner, so you can kind of get a sense of you know what what you're taking on um, if you move in this direction. And and again, you know the 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 goal stated in in the zero trust architecture from NIST is is you know to prevent unauthorized access to data and services and uh, you know to make this um, access control enforcement very granular and and so what do i mean by granular well it could actually be down to the point where it's personal it's you and that you know you are able to access you know only these four systems and maybe you can only access those four systems on certain days of the week or month um, during certain hours. That's not something that we see in perimeter-based security, but in the case of zero trust, um, you, you, you essentially are dealing with policy-based um, controls, and um, that's part of the power of, of zero trust is you can really sort of tighten things down um, to you know, either the user or the entity, down to the application, down to the systems, even, even you know, the segments of the network. So um, if you're not familiar with this document and you're interested in, in zero trust, it's definitely um, a core document to, to basically be paying attention to it. So there are some basic tenets for, for zero trust, and um, I'd be reticent if I didn't sort of make sure that we cover these. Um, so First off, all data sources and compute services are considered resources, and all resources basically need to be you know, protected in, in, in some fashion. Um, all communications is you know, basically secured regardless of the location. So this, this helps deal with the problem of you've got multi-sites, you've got remote versus internal. Um, you're looking at, at networking in a holistic fashion across the board. Um, the the granting of access is um, you know on a per session basis, so it's not one of these where you connect and and then you know from that point forward you will always have access to to that resource. It's every time you connect um, that there's a check as to whether you are permitted to to do anything. So these are real-time kinds of, of checks, and that's that's an element of complexity that differs here from zero trust to, to perimeter. Um, so this is a this is all done by dynamic policy. So for example, if somebody is terminated, and that that detail is pushed into the policy engine, it's immediately reflected throughout the infrastructure you know, that's that's tied into your zero trust implementation. Where in in other settings, uh, that may actually take a fair amount of effort. You know, you've got a system admin that's essentially going out and and uh, either removing out of the directory services or out of the you know, authentication mechanism or in individual accounts on systems. So you know, the, there's there's not the you know perimeter base doesn't necessarily have the policy you know that that allows you to to deal with this kind of situation quickly. Um, there's a monitoring and measuring of, of you know, integrity of, and the, of the security posture of all of these assets. Um, again, this is something that um, isn't necessarily done in the perimeter space, although increasing we're seeing that, um, partly because it's recognized that the perimeter is, you know, simply a speed bump. So. This is where things like, you know, are our, our systems and applications adequately patched? Um, for zero trust, it becomes very important because essentially the internet is at your door, where in a perimeter scenario, there's the illusion that there's something between you and the internet. Um, everything is authenticated and authorized, and it's all done dynamically, and there's strict enforcement. Again, the, the policy engine is, is a huge issue here. And there's a lot of, of uh, information collected about 
uh, you know, the state of the assets and network infrastructure and, you know, who's doing what to, to, to own, you know, kind of scenario. So these are really the, the, the things that Zero Trust is, is dealing with. And if you're taking on Zero Trust, these are the kinds of things that you, you, you have to sort of think through. So, so what, what's the implication here? Well, it, it means you need to understand what kind of resources you have, um, kind of data, in particular, uh, the sensitivity, criticality of that data, um, understanding your user base, uh, and, and and you have to be a lot more vigilant and, and you have to be more strategic in terms of how you're dealing with your security. For some organizations, that can be a pretty radical change. Um, you know, again, back to, I have a hard crunchy shell protecting my infrastructure. I can get kind of sloppy on the inside. Um, you know, with zero trust, that's definitely not the case. It's it's designed to to, to really have things buttoned down, um, and it means you have to be able to uh, respond to changes. So it's not a one and done kind of thing. You, if you've got users who are, um, you know, their roles are changing, or they have multiple roles, but they, you know, which of those are using at any given point in time, you have to basically deal with that. Um, so moving on uh, a little bit more, um, we're we're seeing when when we talk about zero trust architectures that um, there there are what we call elements or pillars, and this this is an example from uh, GSA. So in the U.S. government, the government services agency, I believe, is is what GSA is. Um, so these are are the aspects of of the Arc Zero Trust architecture um, that one focuses on. Um, the the thing that's kind of interesting is is Zero Trust is is not necessarily um, viewed exactly the same by all organizations, even in the U.S. government. So, for example, you'll see that there are are different pillars depending on which agency in the U.S. government that you may be be talking to. But in general, um, these are uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that you you typically work, you know, you have to deal with. Um, my observation is that um, from an architecture perspective, um, the network piece is typically one of the early elements um, that uh, get attention. How, how do you set this up? How do you structure this? Um, and and then sort of moving out uh, from from there. But Again, the, this is intended to show you that from a zero trust, you know, architecture perspective, you need to understand um, all of these elements uh, to some degree, and and then decide which of these you're going to take on, and to, to to what degree. All right. So um, at the heart of zero trust. Um, there are some some major components, and I know this is a bit of an eye chart. Really, what I wanted to sort of draw your attention to is, um, you know, the thing that's probably most different from from those who are used to perimeter-based security. And and that that is essentially in this very very center, you see a policy enforcement point, and then attached to it is um, policy decision point. Um, th this this is think of this as something that's inserted um, in in the middle of uh, how one goes about accessing whatever resources or data that that you need to access. You're going through this policy enforcement point, and this is how the real time policy enforcement you know is is actually handled. And this can be done in a variety of ways, but um, essentially this. Enforcement point is the real time check. Are you at this point in time from wherever you are allowed to access this resource? And and where you are is actually one of the parameters. You may be blocked if you are, you know, let's say you are in Europe, but normally you're US based the policy enforcement point might actually be configured to, no, we're not going to allow this this data that would potentially come out of this resource to 
you know, move into that jurisdiction for, you know, whatever reason, whether it might be GDPR or whatever the reason is. Um, now, so for that policy enforcement point to work, um, you, you actually have to have this policy engine and you have to be able to administer this, you know, the, the policies. And this is the, the policy decision point that, um, that, that sits above it. And these two components are, are really um, a, a big change in, in terms of, of how one implements zero trust, you know, in, in an enterprise. Whether that's done on sort of the large scale or whether uh, you do this for some subset of the, you know, the organization's, you know, protecting the organization's resources. Um, but this, this component is, is the one that um, typically takes the most effort to uh, get in place, get it configured properly. Um, and then it's, even for the user community, it's a bit of a change because it's no longer, you know, do I use single sign-on to go do all this stuff? Well, not so much. Um, you know, there, there's now a, a different set of checks that that basically happen. So the authentication would would happen, but then before you're even granted access to to this, um, you know, there's this check. And to to give you you know an example of of uh, implementations that 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 exist today, um, the Cloud Security Alliance has um, has a specification called the Software Defined Perimeter, and it's really quite an interesting uh, approach um, wherein if your client, so in this diagram, if, if your system uh, has not been pre-configured to even knock at the door of a resource, in other words, it's not known, the, the system that you are attempting to access will not respond. It's almost as if it doesn't exist on the network from your perspective, you would, there'd just be no connection. So unless your system and the users on that system have been registered appropriately, um, you can't even find the resource. As in, and that's an example of, of the power of zero trust if you've, if you've done the implementation. So why is that important? Well, if you can't knock at the door, you can't see the system, you can't mount denial of services attacks against that resource. And so one of the immediate benefits is you're not, you're not being hammered by these kinds of attacks um, you know, from, from, from the internet. There are a bunch of, of you know, to the left and to the right of, of this, you see a lot of, uh, of items that sort of factor in Many of these are not new for zero trust. We're having to deal with you know, monitoring and you know, identity management, and you know, dealing with certificates, you know, for like PKI, um, and and you know, having data access policies. All of these exist in in some form uh, today. Um, but what you're seeing is these all come together, and they they actually can have a significant impact on on what you do with the policy decision point and the policy enforcement point. And there's a little bit of, of additional information, you know, I've already sort of talked through, you know, what, what these things are, you know, that you might not be familiar with. Okay, so I said earlier, Zero Trust has been around for, for years. Now, what's the big deal? Why, why, why is there so much buzz on, on Zero Trust right now? Well, there's, you know, besides NIST publishing, you know, it's, it's architecture, um, there was a small thing called an executive order that came out um, that uh, is essentially causing the, the federal government to, to move in the, the direction of zero trust. The, the agencies were basically told to produce plans in terms of how they're going to you know, start moving in this direction and then start moving in that direction. All right. And, and so this came out you know, back in, in May of 2021. So it's not all that long ago. Um, however, um, that was pretty significant, uh, you know, shot across the bow for, for the agencies. And again, this is not a trivial change. Um, 
And the government is a huge, huge buyer of information communications technology. So as you can imagine, when when you start seeing directives coming out of you know the part of the government that that buys stuff, uh, and they start putting together a buyer's guide <laughs> on zero trust technology, um, that quickly gets the attention of suppliers to the U.S. government. And, and in fact, that's what's happened. So like like in many cases, what we saw with cloud computing. Many, many suppliers are now very focused on, on trying to make sure they've got zero trust uh, systems and, and, and resources and training and software uh, available. I don't want to say there's a lot of zero trust washing like we saw with cloud washing, but you know, there might be a little bit of that going on. Um, so, you know, buyer beware, but um, there are a lot more choices now if you're considering going down the zero trust path, uh, a lot more options. And a lot of this has come from, you know, the, the government basically saying, we're going in this direction, get on board. What do you got to offer, you know, kind of, kind of approach. Okay, so where are we with all this stuff? Well, as I said, US government is definitely implementing it. Um, a bunch of different agencies are, are, are down this path. Uh, a lot of them are focused on the, the networking side. As I said, you know, lots of products are, are basically coming into existence to, to, to deal with this. Um, and even some of these suppliers are, are, um, are beginning to drink their own Kool-Aid, you know, so to speak. So it's, it's a, a we're, we're starting to see enterprises who are not necessarily, uh, you know, in the government or directly supporting them, but are suppliers who are now kind of going, well, gee, maybe we should be doing this ourselves and that'll help us understand you know the government needs and things of that nature the u.s government has also works with lots of international partners uh nato in particular and um so just as a direct result of, of those communications and and some of these partners being exposed to uh, some of the systems that the u.s government's working on you know there there's there's essentially word of mouth if you will uh, on on how to, you know, what's the benefits? What, what do you have to do? What, what are what are the implications? What are the what are the challenges? Um, some of that is is definitely being available. Um, again, I mentioned you know the Cloud Security Alliance. Uh, they've been very active in in the zero trust space. In fact, there's a, uh, a summit coming up in uh, mid November that if you're not aware of, you may, you may want to take a look at. Um, but I mentioned that because CSA is very active internationally as well. So, so they're, they're, they're looking across sort of the, the, the cloud and, and the implications of, of introducing zero trust into those kinds of ecosystems and how they, how they access. So there's, the point being that there's a, a increased interest, U.S. government sort of you know, a driver behind that, but it's starting to get its own its own legs. Part of the challenge, though, is that um, when you move into the international space, um, there just aren't very many specifications or standards that are readily available. You know, as somebody who represents the U.S. on international, you know, like ISO uh, committees, um, U.S. documents um, may be of interest, but they don't necessarily carry any weight, or they they don't get the same recognition as as international standards. And that's that's one of the one of the challenges that we've got right now with with what's going on in zero trust. A lot of activity, U.S. based interest in the international community, um, but uh, the standards in the international side really haven't uh, basically caught up. Okay, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is going on in, in the international space, and, and that's in part kind of why we're having this session you know, today. So IEEE Computer Society um, formed a Zero Trust Security Working Group in 2020. Um, it, and it, it's intended to basically uh, be in a position to deal with essentially any aspect of, of zero trust, in particular the security aspects of zero trust um, that uh, is deemed 
important or necessary. Um, it's intended to do with international standards. That's what IEEE does. Um, and it has some, some additional reach because of arrangements it has with organizations like ISO and, and, and IAC. So this work group was established, as I said, in June 2020. So it's been around for a while. It has two uh, approved projects that are currently under development. And you know the, the chair of this activity is, is Thomas Rivera, and, and uh, that's his email address. Definitely somebody, if you're interested in, in getting plugged into the IEEE's activity, he's definitely a go-to person to, to, to reach out to, or, or myself as well. Um, so what are what are the projects? The, well, the very first project that was started, and this was really intended to just you know get get the IEEE activity underway. Um, this is a recommended practice for zero trust security. Well, what what exactly is a recommended practice? Well, let's think of that as a, a guideline. Um, and so it has you know the intention is to have a collection of shoulds that are sort of wrapped around. Um, you know, you saw earlier the, the pillars. So what are the focus areas? So what kinds of things should an organize, organization be dealing with? And again, the focus here is really on the security aspects of this, as opposed to the overall zero trust architecture, right? So, so this is assuming that when you look across the various architectures, what might one want to to make sure that you focus on from from a security perspective, and that's really what this is is intended to do. Um, and you know, again, one of the early interests uh, in this was the Cloud Security Alliance's, you know, software defined perimeter, um, and, and seeing what what they had done and um, what what you know, an enterprise might need to worry about to, to be able to essentially take advantage of that kind of technology. Um, this early work, because um, it was the only project that existed, uh, had basically everything was being thrown at it. And, and now with, with the second project coming online, and I'll, I'll show you in a second here, um, what's happening is we're teasing out uh, you know the content that really uh, isn't so much focused on the on the guidance, which is think of that as kind of the how to go about doing some of this, as opposed to the what should you be doing, right? And the the what piece is really um, what the second project is dealing with. So so this is a tended to be a standard, and uh, and it's it's a framework. So what do we mean by framework? Well, this is essentially looking at the architectures that exist, and then from there, identifying what are the what are the elements, the pieces that that need to be addressed or should be addressed. And you can anticipate that there will be some shell statements in here. So, for example, when you saw the pillars, there may be four of those that get called out. I'm just making that up. You know, so maybe four of those that you absolutely have to deal with. Because failure to do that means you know you're, you're not in the zero trust neighborhood. Um, so this document will help you figure out you know which of these you need to deal with. But it's also intended to lay out some of the uh, the concepts and and terminology um, that could be used by not only the other IEEE uh, project but uh, other entities that that need to be able to point at an international standard. This is intended to include enough content there that that you you have some of the foundational pieces in place. So this is a brand new project. You can see that um, it was approved uh, 21st of September of this year. So it's uh, just getting started. Um, and you know, as I said earlier, we're we're now um, taking the existing materials, moving them into the right places between the, these two projects. It would not surprise me to see additional um, documents you know, emerge uh, in this working group as we get uh, a little further down the path. Okay, so you know that's from an IEEE perspective, and I mentioned you know ISO is doing work. Well, there's a particular um, activity 
in, in ISO. So underneath JTC1, which does information technology, um, subcommittee 27 is focused on information security, cybersecurity, and privacy, privacy protections, I should say. Um, and so if you're familiar with the ISO 27000 series, this is the organization that, that, that does these among, among other things. So there currently aren't any, any zero trust oriented standards being either published or even under development in SC27. And, and we, we literally just wrapped up the most recent meeting, but there's zero trust is coming up as a, as a topic um, and, and something to be considered. So it's, it's on, you know, ISO SC27's radar scope and you know my my not so clear crystal ball um, you know indicates that um, with a potential revision of the network security series, this is the twenty seven zero thirty three documents. There there are seven parts in in that series. Um, my my hunch is that uh, this is likely to be one of the the early places where we will see zero trust get introduced. Well, why would we do that? Well, this standard is very much focused on perimeter-based security and, and you know, networking being one of the early focuses for zero trust. It makes sense that this is where where you're most likely, uh, uh, you know, kind of got to introduce those kind of concepts. So, um, you know, the revision, the updates, the 27033 haven't started, but we are at a point where we're investigating, studying, if you will, um, and and I think it's just a matter of time before this gets kicked off for 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 an update and probably an overhaul of the entire the entire series. Now I'm bringing that because IEEE Computer Society has what's called a category A liaison with SE27. In other words, we have the ability to work directly with C27 um, in in a collaborative manner or simply commenting on their documents, even submitting projects. And so the work in these, the IEEE Zero Trust Security Working Group is, is definitely looking at the possibility of bringing its two projects ultimately into SE27 for what we call triple branding. So possibly as an ISO, IEC, IEEE uh, standard once they're done. Um, that, that dynamic could, could change. Um, it's possible that um, even if we didn't do this because of the international nature of IEEE's work, um, you know, the documents being done in IEEE can easily be referenced by, by ISO as well. Um, but there are some advantages to, to having, you know, this kind of triple branding. It makes it more consumable by certain national bodies. Um, so at this point, and, and this is part of what the session is, is to make sure that national bodies and experts around the world are aware of, of you know, the IEEE Computer Society's zero trust activities. Um, the working group is set up as an individual based membership. Um, and so participation in the work group is very easy. Uh, there are no fees associated no encumbrance. So, for example, if you were to join the U.S. committee to work with SC27, um, you know there are often fees associated with that. There are restrictions on on you, know, you have to be U.S. domicile. There are a bunch of other national bodies that that are involved, and you know you could join those other national bodies if they're relevant. In the case of IEEE, at least this particular working group, um, a, a lot of that is not uh, not something that you have to navigate. So. Apologies for sounding like a car salesman, but if you are interested in standardization of zero trust, it is one of the places where you can engage fairly easily. Okay, so zero trust, you know, we've had a, a lot of, shall we say, fads in the security space. It is looking like zero trust is, is here to stay. Um, it's been around for a while. We're seeing a lot of formalization when you start seeing organizations like ISO, um, you know, looking at it, especially with, you know, the potential impact it can have on, you know, uh, the portfolio of standards, it's a pretty good indication that it's pretty serious. And, and that's definitely what we're, we're, we're seeing. Um, it is a very big departure from perimeter security. So 
um, it, it's not a, a casual adventure if you move in this direction. So you really do need to be careful in your planning. You want to be strategic. You, you want to understand why you're doing it. And you probably want to make sure you're, you know, you, you're bringing these protections for most likely your most sensitive or, or most valuable or most critical kinds of resources. Um, and, you know, zero trust really can, can add uh, a, a layer of protection that, uh, you know, is warranted for, for those kinds of things. Whether you do it for your whole environment, you know, that's, that's going to be a business, you know, decision. And it is possible to operate in what we call a hybrid model where, where you're using zero trust for, for certain aspects. Um, and, and a lot of organizations doing a transition, you know, are starting with, uh, you know, a subset of, of their, you know, their, their ecosystems, if you will. And, and I would also say that you know, this is a bit of a sort of call to arms. You know, if you 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 are interested in zero trust, you you want to you want to get involved in the sausage making of standards, then uh, I would encourage you to join the uh, security and storage work group within uh, IEEE Computer Society, and and the the working group is under the Cybersecurity and Privacy Standards Committee. So with that, I see we potentially have some questions here. Uh, let's see if I can answer some of these. So Don has asked, are there relationships between zero trust and blockchain technologies? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. Blockchain, from, from my perspective, is, um, is just one of many security tools that you can use um i i i can see where its use um especially with some of the monitoring and recording uh you know could be valuable because you you if you're trying to establish a sort of a trail of of what happens certain transactions um the use of of uh blockchain uh helps you move that from, yeah, that's useful information to might even be evidentiary in nature. But zero trust in and of itself um, is not dependent on blockchain itself. Um, but I can clearly see there, there are potential uses you know, for it. Um, let's see. Sounds like zero trust cloud services and zero trust for IoT and, and IoT are, are also needed. Um, again, very, very interesting observation. Um, when, you, when you set up, uh, when you implement zero trust uh, and, and you're, you're basically dealing with the security aspects of it, um, you do need to be aware of, of your cloud services and of course all, all your nodes, your end devices. Um, and in fact, you know, I mentioned earlier the Cloud Security Alliance's software defined perimeter. They in fact um, have, have many successes in wrapping uh, cloud services from your favorite cloud service provider um, and and giving sort of an extra layer of protection where you can do things in the cloud that you might not normally be comfortable doing. Having having something like SDP or or another another piece of uh, you know zero trust technology there, you know, can help out. But but yeah, you, you definitely you know any anywhere you've got resources and data, you, you absolutely need to factor that in. So cloud is no no exception. Uh, it would it would need to be in there and IOT um, you know depending on what the IOT is capable of yeah it, it, it needs to be a, a, a party to this and if it if it can't actively participate then from a zero trust perspective you've got to figure out how how you could recognize it and and then you know what what kind of you know how do you authenticate it and and how do you authorize what it wants to, to do? Um, 
Would zero trust be a prerequisite for implementing CBDC? Yes. Um, hmm. I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Because I'm not sure what your 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 CBDC is in this context. Um, can you give us an example of having authentication and authorization dynamic in a zero trust model? Um, yeah, so a simplistic one, and I'll, I'll use not not to, you know, my intention isn't necessarily just to plug the the cloud security lines, but it's definitely something you can you can go you can go deal with. So let's say that you've got a um, HR system running, and all of your HR personnel are out in the field, and if you've deployed something like the software defined perimeter, you know, a zero trust mechanism. Um, you know, prior to to uh, being able to access systems, um, you wouldn't necessarily need a VPN, for example. But uh, your your computer system, your laptop, and the users on that would all be registered with um, you know the decision point, as you know, we described earlier. And now you bring up the particular application, um, and it's going to uh, essentially say hey I need to I need to go access this resource um, to to a you know policy enforcement point and that policy enforcement point checks to see if you're legitimate yep you are it would then notify the you know the HR system you're going to get a, a connection request from Billy Bob Joe uh, running on this system you know you're, you're allowed to uh, to accept it and the user then, you know, attempts to connect, and um, as part of that connection, a secure session gets set up, um, not necessarily with a VPN, but as part of the session itself. And uh, again, you you do the authentication dance that you need to do, you know, for that particular resource, and then you're granted access. If you the user move to, you know, your your spouse's. Uh, laptop which had not been registered and attempted to do exactly the same thing um, you would not even get to the uh, policy enforcement point I mean you would knock at the door but it wouldn't it's like I don't know who you are you're not registered with me it wouldn't even respond to you and likewise if you tried to reach out to you know, the HR system um, it wouldn't respond to you either um, because they're like I don't know who you are and this is back to you know helping you guard against Things like denial of service attacks, and you know, if you've got, you know, attackers will often sort of sweep through, you know, the address range that's you know assigned to a particular enterprise, looking for systems. Well, if the systems don't respond, um, you know, it's it, it's like that IP address, for example, doesn't exist, and it will move on. And and that's you know one of the aspects of zero trust is, you you literally can hide systems from, from uh, you know, people coming in from the internet. They don't, even if they know they're there, if they're not um, pre-configured to access it, they get nothing. Um, let's see. Let's see if I missed anything here. Um, do you see potential for zero trust to be uh, used to secure AI, especially to be used to prevent attacks against AI systems? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the concerns that um, we're, we're seeing um, with with artificial intelligence is, you know, making sure that um, essentially the during the learning process, there's not a poisoning or or even sort of destruction of of you know you've you've spent you know, all this time and money to to train your uh, you know in the case of generative AI your 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 AI and um, only to have it basically get compromised um, and you essentially have to start over. So yeah, zero trust could definitely be used to to protect it. Um, not that it it presents a um, a unique challenge from a zero trust perspective. Uh, in in many ways, it would be um, like any other system. So it's not necessarily special for AI, but I, I agree it would definitely be uh, useful not only 
for protecting the AI, you know, the integrity of the AI, but also limiting who has access to it. So if you're not just flopping something out on the internet, you know, to let people play with, but you really, you know, you've hand trained this to do certain things in your enterprise and you want to restrict that, you're almost considering it as your intellectual property, um, you, you absolutely could use zero trust to, to put a wrapper around it. A uh, question about, um, will it call for participation in new IEEE standards be coming out soon? Um, these, um, that's an interesting question. Um, both of these projects are active, but with with the new uh, P3409, um, yeah, it's probably worth uh, uh, doing some some outreach on the IEEE side, which has you know a massive number of of of, of people that that see those kinds of announcements. We haven't done that, um, and that's that's a that's a good suggestion. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, the question is, it seems that zero trust requires more authentication access control than perimeter security. This may bring down performance and user experience. Um, yeah, you know, that's, um, and how could we address the performance issues, especially for services applications that have real time requirements? Um, the the user experience is one of the the challenge areas um i don't want to say users are 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 lazy but you know they sure do like single sign on <laughs> and and the dynamic nature of zero trust um it 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 requires a little more effort from the user community to uh to essentially ensure that these protections in place, so um, it, it has it has had an impact on its on its adoption. Um, now that's on the one side. Users can also be very creative in terms of getting around you know, security features, and in the case of zero trust, um, they're less likely to be able to do that. Uh, so that creativity is often not rewarded by, by alternate channels. Um, but it's definitely something to factor in when you're moving in the, in the direction of zero trust. Um, how do you enforce a policy enforcement point? Boy, that's the, that's the uh, I'd say the $30,000 question is probably more than that. Um, yeah, this is, this is the, this is one of the, the, the biggest challenges. And I said, it's kind of the heart and soul of zero trust. So there, there are, um, you know, the good news is there's multiple technology options in, in place to, to do this kind of work. Um, but it's the piece that you, not only you have to basically implement, but then you've got to essentially um, set up the policy, you know, set up the policies and and then tie those back to the resources and, and, and users. So this is, this is, this is the big lift um, when you're going down the zero trust path. Um, is it anticipated that IEEE will use the NIST work to inform uh, its new work? Um, so there, there's definitely um, been some conversations with NIST. The intention of the IEEE work is to leverage to the maximum degree possible the, the early work that NIST and CISA and, and GSA have done. We, you know, there's no intention to go off and and do a reference architecture per se, or or an architecture standard at this point. Um, we we definitely want to take advantage of, you know, the of the the good work that NIST has and, and the U.S. government's already done. Um, let's see. Does Zero Trust imply that if you log on to use an app and that app uses APIs to interact with remote computers? And they may do the same. Should your access be checked on those remote computers? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, now, it's possible that um, the way you've constructed your policy enforcement point, um, you you could, in fact, at the time you connected with the first system, uh, you know that 
use might be made available to all the downstream systems. So there, there is a, a way, it's possible to basically exploit your policy enforcement point. Um, on the other hand, the relationship between two servers might actually be a system to system relationship and it may not have anything to do with the individual users. So again, um, it, it, you know, I'll give you the lawyer answer, it depends. But uh, yes, you could in fact, you know, sort of control the user as it, it hops through various resources. Uh, and, uh, and then the flip side, if it's a system to system relationship, again, zero trust can be used to, to deal with those kinds of relationships as well. All right, excellent, Eric. That, that was a fantastic presentation and a and a really um, really great Q and A we we just had there. Thank you, everyone, for submitting all those excellent questions. Um, we're, since we're at the end of the webinar, just a quick um, programming note or two. Um, as we have a few additional webinars coming up um, between now and the end of the year. Um, the next webinar is on November 7th, which is also from the Standards Activities Board webinar series. That is from our well-known 802 standards titled Next Generation Wi-Fi Positioning, an Overview of IEEE 802.11 AEC. And then we have um, Two more from our Build Your Career web webinar series on November 8th. So the next day, demystifying agile project management. And then on December 7th, the four, language, the four languages of influence. Again, I'd like to thank Eric Hibbard for joining us today and his great presentation. All of you again for your lively um, participation in the Q&A we just had. Um, thank you again and have a great, great rest of your day. Thanks, Scott.